First of all, thanks, Linda, for taking the time out to be with us this morning for, for chairing the event. I, I also want to start by thanking uh, Terry uh, and Martin and, indeed, everybody that's here today for, for coming along and helping us to launch this uh, way of the Dragon Report. I mean, while I'm on thanks, I should also say, uh, Linda's also mentioned him, but thanks to Tim Page, our senior policy officer, who's actually pulled together uh, this report. I mean, one of my jobs at the TUC is to come along and speak at events and take credit for work that lots of other bright people have done instead of me. And in this, in this case, it, it's Tim. And Tim is going to join us on the panel for questions and discussion uh, uh, later on. I mean, this is a really important piece of work for us here uh, at the TUC. And it's a report that I think really sets out to answer uh, two key questions. First of all, uh, and I think the first question is, what can we do to take advantage of the shift of economic power uh, to the east? And that shift has been uh, as rapid as it has been uh, dramatic. Just to give you a little personal reflection on the pace of change and how quickly that shift uh, has taken place. Uh, my grandfather in 1942, my grandfather uh, Ching Sang, uh, came to uh, Liverpool uh, from Hong Kong. He was a cook uh, with the Merchant Navy, and he was one of 20,000 Merchant Navy men who came from China and Hong Kong who lived in Liverpool, played uh, a part in the war effort. Uh, he went on to marry a uh, a Liverpool Irish woman, they had 11 kids, uh, they brought them up in the shadow of uh, Chinatown in Liverpool, he stayed in Liverpool uh, all of his life and in many ways he was one of the lucky ones, not just because he met my uh, grandmother but because at the end of the war the British government decided that those Chinese merchant navy men uh, weren't playing a vital part in the war effort, uh, they were now deemed an undesirable element uh, and around 1300 of those men were forcibly repatriated uh, from Liverpool back to China and Hong Kong. Some of them left behind their families, uh, their wives. Uh, many of the men who remained actually were uh, uh, denied work or priced out of work in an attempt to get them to return uh, back uh, voluntarily. Now that was a, a scandal, it's only been recently uh, revealed, but I think it was a, a, quite a revealing one because it, the reason it could happen, the reason it wasn't uh, an outrage at the time was because those men were regarded, and certainly my grandfather felt during his time uh, in Liverpool as uh, sec second-class citizens from a second-class uh, country. Now, fast forward 40 years uh, to me growing up a couple of generations later. When I was in school uh, in the early 1980s, China was regarded as a developing country. 80% of the Chinese population uh, lived in the countryside. When I started university in the 1990s, uh, I mean, you were laughed at if you bought a Hyundai or a Kia. These were cars that were just emerging onto the uh, UK market. Today, both those companies are in the top 100 uh, global brands. And if I bring that personal picture right up to date, today my daughter, who's 12, just started uh, state secondary school. The, daughter, uh, the granddaughter uh, of Ching, Ching Sang is now learning Mandarin Chinese in school alongside French. Uh, China accounts for a quarter of all postgraduate students in our universities. Uh, the UK government is very keen, desperate to court Chinese investment in UK infrastructure, whether that's high speed too. Uh, or nuclear power stations, and as the report points out, China is on course to be potentially the world's largest economy by 2016, and that's an incredible amount of change in a relatively small amount of time, and that poses huge challenges to us here in the UK, but I would argue it also presents real opportunities uh, as well to us here in the UK and indeed across Europe, and I think the report, the first thing the report really does set out to do is identify those opportunities and what more we can do to take advantage of them. Uh, 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 going forward. The second thing the report tries to do is identify what lessons we can learn and apply from the emergence of China uh, and East Asia. And it's those lessons that I really want to focus uh, my opening remarks on this morning. Before I do, I think it's important to set out a caveat. I don't think anybody in this room, certainly nobody at the TUC, is going to pretend that you can take China, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and simply use those as a model template uh, that we can apply here uh, in the UK. There are some basic issues. We know what some of those issues are. For us, poor records on democracy, on human rights, on trade unions, on industrial action are not issues that can be simply explained away as cultural differences. Now, it's a very mixed picture uh, out in East Asia, in South Korea, uh, a very strong active trade union movement, but the country itself is in the midst of an anti-union crackdown with some unions banned and de-recognised. Union officers have been raided, union leaders arrested, ILO standards ignored. In China, the ACFTU is part of the Chinese state, and we know that the lack of genuine democracy, limited political and media freedoms, pure, poor human rights records are well documented. 
And they're very real concerns, but just as we shouldn't look at China and East Asia through rose-tinted glasses, it's also important to recognise that there is some movement and some progress in the right direction. In China, uh, there are moves towards greater democracy, pluralism, transparency, albeit uh, on its own terms. And just last week, I mean, I don't know if people saw the report in the FT, uh, they reported on an ACFTU chapter head who's leading a very active and high-profile campaign against Walmart, a company, ironically, that doesn't recognise unions in its home uh, country, the United States, who are in the midst of a restructuring programme. So that's an exception, maybe, but it's not an isolated exception, and it's one that might have been unthinkable not so long ago. So let's take it for red, hopefully, for this conversation today, that we're not suggesting that we simply pick up the Chinese model and transplant it to the UK. What we are trying to do with this report, though, is show that we can learn from that rapid and sustained growth that we've seen in China and across East Asia. There are lots of po uh, points and recommendations uh, in the report. I thought maybe I'd just kick off uh, my contribution, hopefully it leads into the discussion, uh, by identifying three of those key lessons. The first one, and Linda has already uh, alluded to this, we think a key thing that comes out of the report is the need for us to strengthen our commitment to an active industrial strategy to support key sectors such as pharmaceuticals, aerospace, renewables, the creative uh, industries. And we believe at the heart of that active industrial strategy should be high quality jobs, the creation and retention of high quality jobs. A key part of that strategy we believe is recognising the role of the public sector broadly uh, defined in supporting the sectors that are going to drive economic growth uh, into the future. So whether you think about the BBC, uh, the NHS, our local councils, universities and colleges, what role can we encourage them to play in developing and supporting our industrial uh, ecosystems? Second point that we think is important is that we don't need to just talk about industrial policy. We need to fund and resource industrial policy. And we believe that that renewed and active industrial policy needs to be properly financed uh, by government. That means lots of things. It means stop it, stepping up our investments in research and development, as the report identifies South Korea currently spends five times more on research and development than most European countries. And the TUC believes there's more that UK government and UK PLC can do to boost investment in research and development, including boosting the budget of the Technology Strategy Board. We also think it's time for the creation of a UK state investment bank, one which would issue bonds guaranteed by government to support SMEs, to support investment in large-scale infrastructure projects, effectively to invest in Britain's industrial future. And finally, on this point about active industrial policy, it also means that the government needs to be prepared to make strategic investments in companies where it's in the long-term interest of the economy. Now, that's not quite as radical as it sounds. The reality is that the government already intervenes in a limited way where market gaps uh, develop. For example, we're spending, the government is spending on making £1 billion available to support the development of carbon capture, storage technology, something that the TUC has been very supportive of uh, in this country. And we would say that there is a scope and a need for the government to think about how it can consciously play a more active and more interventionist role. Third and perhaps final point to draw from the report is I think it, it really signals the need for us to look outwards as a country, to identify and map growing markets in East Asia to help British exporters to thrive to equip our young people with the skills they're going to need, in particular the language skills that they're going to need to take advantage of the new opportunities that are presented by the growth of East Asia. And finally, for us really to think about our membership of the European Union within the context of this rapidly changing uh, world. Being in the European Union, uh, and this is important at a time when we've got an in-out referendum mooted uh, in the not-so-distant future, gives us a continued influence in terms of international trade agreements, which are crucial as the Eastern economies develop and as trade flows continue to increase. But it also gives us an opportunity to proactively encourage and spread the European social model to other economies uh, as well. Social partnership, worker representation uh, on boards and in strategic de decision-making, fundamental rights at work, the role of trade unions, decent social safety nets, these are all fundamental to our vision of a, a, of a world economy and world trade that is fair uh, at every level. So, as I say, I think lots to draw from the report, hopefully lots uh, to uh, hear about in the discussion that will follow. I've probably spoken enough. I'm looking forward to Terry and Martin's contributions and then to uh, your contributions in the debate that follows this morning. Thank you.